Hello, everybody. I'm Mitchell Rose. I'm an associate professor of dance filmmaking here in the Department of Dance at the Ohio State University. I'm speaking to you from Worthington, Ohio at this very moment. Um, so let's see. Um, I talked about the structure of what we're going to do. Okay, <clears throat> so let's start off watching a film. And, uh, but first, let me just give you some <clears throat> international gestures so we can communicate when people are muted. When the film is over, this is the international gesture for the film is over. Okay, so if you can do that when it's done. And this is the international gesture for you're, you're talking, but you're muted. Okay, something big like that that I can see. So, you're all on MitchellRose.com now, right? So, let's um, first watch Dear John. I think it's the first movie. It's three minutes long. When you're done, give me the sign. Okay, everybody? See you in the three minutes. Okay, so, let me give you a brief bio, because you got to do that. All right. I started college in electrical engineering. I've been like a science kid. Uh, and then in sophomore year, I needed phys ed credit and I thought it would be a good way of meeting girls. So I took choreography one. My college had two choreography classes, dance classes. And um, so on day one of that, I got, this is what I want to do. And so I became the college's first dance major, having created the major myself. I had never seen modern dance. I didn't even know what the, what the word choreography meant. So within a month, um, I have to choreograph a dance. Uh, this was a fantastic way to start. I didn't know any of the conventions of the form. I didn't know, well, typically in modern dance, you, you, you come marching in on the bold diagonal, and then at the end, you sit in the spotlight and kind of like whimper as you die. Um, I didn't know any of these conventions. I, I didn't know what it's supposed to look like at all. So I was throwing in sports. I was throwing in yoga, just like whatever I could think of. To me, the theater or dance at that point was just like, there's a stage and for several minutes, people stare at you. <laughs> and so you have to do something that enthralls them. This was a fantastic way to begin, to be open to all possibilities. Um, to have what I call, well, not what I call, it's a Zen concept, Zen, Zen MP, a beginner's mind. We'll be talking about that a little bit more in a, in a, in a bit. Um, but I think that sense of beginner's mind and being open to all possibilities has pervaded my work all through my work as a choreographer and then later as a filmmaker. So after college, I moved to New York. I started a dance company. For 15 years, I toured everywhere. It specialized in comedy, like doing comedic modern dance and because there wasn't a whole lot of that we actually did well we got a lot of gigs and traveled around but then after 15 years I was tired of it I didn't feel like I had anything else to say on stage I made 76 pieces and I didn't have anything more to say and it hurt too much to do so I began thinking like what else am I gonna do now? Uh, and after a couple of years of soul searching, I decided to go into film. So I disbanded the company, I moved to Hollywood, and I went to the American Film Institute and their conservatory and their, uh, as a directing fellow and, for th and did that for three years. Once I was there, I got totally enthralled in um, uh, Hollywood movie making. So now that's, now that's what I wanna do. And so for 10 years after AFI, I was doing the Hollywood hustle, I was writing screenplays, I was having meetings with producers, stuff like that. Then there was this fellowship at UCLA uh, called the Dance Media Fellowship. It was for six people for two months, exploring ways of filming dance and trying to capture dance's aliveness in a two-dimensional medium. And I didn't think it was gonna be a career path, I just thought, uh, it'll really be fun to revisit dance after all these all these years and synthesize these two loves of dance and film. So I did this. I did this thing, uh, and you you make a film during that. And dear John, the film that you just watched was the thing that I made in that. Now I didn't mean to become like dance film guy, but John Lennon says that uh, life is what happens to us when you're busy making other plans. So all of a sudden. I begin getting commissions from dance companies to make more films, and 
then I got a gig at Cal Arts teaching dance film for four years there. And then I got this gig at Ohio State. Uh, and I've been, this is my ninth year here. <clears throat> so um, now I'm dance film guy. I, don't, I also make films that aren't a dance film, they're a regular film film. Um, but that aspect of like big, being open to all possibilities. I've tried to do that on my work and I, I never try to make the same piece twice if I can avoid it. And, um, and yeah. Okay, so now let's watch one more film and then I'll start my PowerPoint. So on MitchellRose.com, we're now going to watch Advance. Two minutes, 45 seconds, see you then. <laughs> Remember to take notes <clears throat> if you have any <clears throat> um, uh, questions for at the end. I see that Kara is doing that already. She's got a whole bunch of notes uh, already for me. Uh, okay, so I want to give a talk now on um, uh, my particular orientation to dance film, which I think is kind of a unique position, having been in the dance world, but then totally put that aside, and then just becoming a filmmaker, and then revisiting dance. I think that's a unique position, having that, have, having film thinking be the way, because a lot of dance films made by dance artists who then decide, hey, I want to make a film, I mean, they're kind of still thinking like dancers. Now, I have a script for my PowerPoint, it's here. So I'm gonna be reading from here. Please excuse the psychic disconnect as I like face this way often. All right, so <clears throat> many of us here are dancers and so we love dance. In fact, it might occupy most of what we think about and so being dance centric, it can be easy to jump to the conclusion that dance film is dance that's on film. But while it does convey an experience of dance, dance film is film. In fact, I've had an article published in which I arrogantly insist upon calling, calling it dance film because it's film, as opposed to screen dance or dance for camera or similar terms which somehow seem to be trying to make it into a form of dance. It's a form of film and it requires film thinking. Because of our possible predilections for seeing dance film as a form of dance, I think it's important to step back from our patterns of thought and take a fresh look at things. So let's go back to the beginning and could you tell me what is dance, the performing art form? If anybody has a thought about, you know, this thing that you spend most of your life doing, what it is, um, unmute yourself and tell the world. I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, what I use as a definition is dance is the manipulation of the body and time and space with energy and the intention of it being dance. Okay. So you've given this some thought. <laughs> Actually, I think, I think that's pretty damn good. Um, did anybody, anybody else have any thoughts? Nobody has, yeah, go ahead. It's the movement of the body to express constant views and emotion. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> okay, um, hey, uh, oh yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, let's, let's go back even further and let me ask you, what is art? The thing that contains dance, what is art? I would say it's the expression of concepts, ideas, and emotions. I'm gonna go with a cunning contrivance. It's artful. Okay, well, art is that, but is that what art is? I didn't, I didn't catch that. Oh, no. Can you repeat it? Um, how do I speak? Uh, I said that art is a cunning contrivance. And he said, art is that, but is that all that it is? Right. So and, and I, how, I'm not sure how to speak. You know, we hear you. Uh, so go, so continue. So We're I, here. 
Good. I'd like to offer two things. To, one, to go back to what is dance. Mm -hmm. And for me, dance is intentional, expressive movement. So it's intentional and it's expressive. And almost the same thing for art, that it is about uh, expression in whatever medium. So for dance, that expression comes through in movement. And it's intentional, not random. So, Fantastic. Well, I think those are great. Um, hey, let me... Um, I want to show you a poem here by Simone Corday. <clears throat> it's a simple four word poem. So could you take a moment to read through the poem, try to figure out what it means for you, see if you can come up with the meaning of this poem is. Just take a few moments to look at it and then I'll, um, it's a translation, of course, uh, and then um, I'll ask for some interpretations. So go ahead. Okay, thoughts? Anybody have a feeling about what this poem means or means to them? Uh, it feels like a story, even though it's only in four words, mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot that can be filled in right. uh, on the connection between each word. Yeah. Anyone mm -hmm. else? I was gonna, I was gonna say a similar thing that uh, it felt like it was all of the players of the story with all of the action taken away. Uh -huh. the, the bones, I guess, if you will. Right, okay. Uh, I think those are both, uh, those are both fine. But here's the thing. Um, it's not a poem and there's no, no such person as Simone Corday. These are just four words that I just took out of the headlines of the newspapers. But <laughs> what happened when, when you went on this little journey? What happened, like when I said, here's a poem, what's happening for you? You went on this little journey inside. You went to your best place. All of your different for all of your different elements of your life experience, you try to bring to this moment and go, hmm, there's something here. What is it? What does this mean to me? You went on this little journey inside, and you turned up the level of sensitivity to eleven, uh, the the, lo the level of awareness to try to go. There's a meaning here. What is it? <clears throat> Our best selves want to understand. And when we go inside on a journey of art, we e evoke those best selves. Hey, you know, I've been working on a piece of visual art for the last six months. And I've really honed it, and I think I've got it uh, in, in a pretty good shape now, and I'd like to share that with you and, uh, and, I'll, and, and see how you feel about it. So let me come over here. So there it is. How do you like it? <laughs> I look at this and here's like this empty green field. It's like emptiness and yet there's an object of control here. Can you control chaos? Can you control emptiness? And why green? Green is the color of growth. It's also the color of money and greed. Is it about we're a power hungry uh, consumptive society or something like that? So God, there's so much to, to think about when you see that. In art, we put a frame around a piece of life that identifies the thing inside as hyperlife. This frame, whether a proscenium arch or a rectangle of projected image, demands of the spectator, the contents of this are special. Turn it up. Look within yourself and identify the specialness. The key element that differentiates art from some stuff on the wall is intentionality. And that was the one word that I consistently heard in my definitions of, of art and, and uh, dance. So those were fantastic. Intentionality. A person declaring, I made this special thing to be considered in a special way. Sometimes our view of dance gets stiff from how much work we do on stage. Someone says, I went and saw that new work of that new choreographer. And we dance eccentrics have this vision. There they are, uh, all those dancers over there in that rectangular volume. 
I can see all of them way over there. They're facing me and moving in sideways planes. I remain sitting here so they stay the same size. Sometimes they come and go from that rectangular volume. And the light goes up and down and the time advances smoothly and unbroken. And after some minutes, the lights go down and stay down. That's our reflexive dance thinking. We envision whole bodies that stay the same size. They move horizontally, sometimes disappearing off the sides. They stay in the same space with time progressing linearly for the duration of the piece. And that thinking will not serve us, uh, will not serve US filmmakers because dance film is film, a different way to think. In film, the performers don't have to always present themselves facing us. They don't have to stay the same size and we don't have to see all of their bodies. They can be a football field away or a foot away. We're granted incredible, intimate access to get right up to a person and look into their eyes, those windows of the soul. They don't have to stay in the same space. They don't even have to stay in the same time. That's incredible artistic freedom. So to step into this different world, I think it's important that we loosen our attachments to long developed thinking patterns and see with first time eyes. You know, when you have a friend come and visit you from out of town <clears throat> and it's their first time to the town. And so you begin showing them around and you go like, and this is the Capitol building. And, and all of a sudden you see through their eyes, you put yourself in a state of empathy with them and you go like, you see the building for the first time through their eyes. Uh, it's, and it, it's that fresh, unjaded, unexpert way of seeing things so that when you see things, you see them for the first time. Where am I? Uh, there. There's a Zen concept of beginner's mind that I mentioned before, to be open to all possibilities. And a Zen quote goes, in the mind of the beginner, there are many possibilities. In the mind of the expert, there are few. And like I was saying before, that aspect of um, not being an expert <clears throat> and just being open to all possibilities. Likewise, I think it's good to have an open view of dance films possibilities because it can be so many things. It's good to go back to the beginning, to a place before we began to become experts and our thinking began to become set, to have a fresh look at what dance is and what art is. But just to be clear about what dance film is not, from my perspective, simply shooting a stage dance. I don't call documentation dance film. You can turn a stage dance into a dance film, but it has to be adapted, the way a novel is adapted into a screenplay as it's translated from one medium to another. Dance has, dance. Long, had, dance has long had a presence in cinema, but Busby Berkeley or Fred Astaire is also not the sense of dance film we're talking about here. Those are examples of dancing that is filmed beautifully. My perspective of dance film is not merely recording some dance. The film is the dance. Images choreographed from the ground up. So to what dance film is, this is my definition of the field. It's a visual medium that has as its content dance art that is solely meant for that medium or has the intentionality to evoke an experience of dance. The first originates with dancing, the second does not necessarily. It could be a randomly swirling piece of fabric. But the results of both are an experience of dance in the spectator. By experience of dance, I mean that while watching a dance film, one has an experience that feels like the experience one has while watching dance. This definition means there doesn't even have to be a human involved. Let me show you some video clips and you decide, are these dance films? And then you can, uh, and, then, and then let me know. So let me just show you a couple of clips. So here's this one. <laughs> So what do you think, dance film? 
What is that one key element that it lacks that we were talking about before? Expression and intentionality. Intentionality, right. This is Marcel walking on a treadmill. There's no intentionality to have, to make people think or feel about dance, right? Uh, okay, how about this one? Hop, hop, look. Dancers go hop, hop, and birds go hop, hop. Dance film? It's a void. It's just a void. There's no intentionality of, of evoking an experience of dance in this. Uh, let me show you some a little more bird footage. Okay, so what do you think? Dance film? Why? I mean, sure, it's longer, it has music, and some of the movements resemble human movements, but to me, I, I, I feel dance when I watch this. Um, this is an excerpt from Birds by uh, British filmmaker David Hinton, and it conveys an undeniable experience of dance. <clears throat> um, Sorry. Uh, when watching it, I feel like I do when, it, when watching dance. The same neurons are firing. But here, the editing is the choreography. And this can only exist on film. In dance film, those same elements that make dance dance, motion, musicality, space, design, are melded with film language into a cinematic reimagining of the dance dynamic. And this reimagining of what dance is, is why I'm stressing going back to the beginning and reassessing our fundamental uh, um, imagining about dance. If you come at dance film with your old dance thinking, it's harder to come up with a wonderfully fresh reconceiving of dance like birds. Dance now has two paths, theatrical and filmic, real and artificial. Theater conforms to real time and real space. There it is, the thing taking place right there before you as a whole, a, phenomenolog a phenomenologically lived experience happening 50 feet away. And it's beautiful to have that real experience of real people up there huffing and puffing and sharing their humanity with you. Film isn't real life, it's hyper life. It doesn't have to conform to time and space. It takes different elements of them and creates an artificial construct. And I don't demean the word artificial. Magic is artificial, but it uplifts the heart in wonderment. Picasso famously said, art is a lie that tells the truth. So here's the dance film spectrum, and I'm arranging this on a diagonal to try to not favor one end. This isn't good, bad, this is different approaches. At one extreme, they went to a location and shot the, the entirety of a piece of choreography using perhaps various camera angles and interesting cinematography. This is what I call a dance in a place, and its artistic engine is the choreography. And at this extreme is birds. It's a completely filmic construction using film language. The editing is the choreography. This extreme minimally uses the medium. This extreme is the medium. And then there's all the gradations in between. Of my 35 films, I've made one film on the dance in a place side, Here's an excerpt. Morally the bird may flee the willow's golden hair Swing through winter fitfully on the stormy air Yet if thine eyes I see gloom will soon depart For to me Sweet 
shine through the heart. This woman was a student in our department and she showed this dance in a showing and I thought it would be great to film it in the snow. It's a dance filmed in a place. So that's one approach. But my personal interest is on the right half of the spectrum in using constructions to tell movement stories and filmic dance poems that convey an experience of dance. I wanna show a scene from a short film called Outside In. The director is Margaret Williams and the choreographer is Victoria Marks. So it's uh, just one scene, a couple minutes long. So take a look at this and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Uh, it's a wonderful film, but let's take a look at the organizing principles that are dance-based thinking and the one, those that are film, film thinking based, sorry, uh, in this scene. <clears throat> First, that are those that are dance thinking based. It's continuously frontal with a proscenium-like orientation. It happens in continuous time in, 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 in the same space. The choreographic engine originates only from the dancing, not from a filmic construction. And there are theatrical effects of lighting and fog. And now the film language used in the scenes. There are cuts <clears throat> offering us different perspectives. There is repeated action and punch-ins to close-ups to allow for intimacy. But that's all. This scene is a dance filmed beautifully in a place. In fact, an audience could have sat in that warehouse and watched it with largely the same experience. I left dance as, to become a filmmaker, and I returned to dance as a filmmaker. In my work, I strive to convey an experience of dance through cinematic grammar. With my films, I want to convey an experience of dance on the screen, and which happens because it was constructed from the ground up using film language. If you're coming at dance film as a choreographer ready to make a dance, rather than as a filmmaker ready to construct a film, the film frame can start to become a surrogate for the proscenium. There are other possibilities. To find them, dispel yourself of your expert dance thinking. Become a beginner. Okay, so that's the, that's the deal. My little PowerPoint, it's over, thank God. Um, let's take a look at one more uh, film. Now, in, when you were watching Advance, there was this moment where this dog came up to, to Jamie and it like almost gets to him and just as, and we're thinking, what's gonna happen when it gets there? But just before it does, uh, it cuts out to the, to the next shot. And there's that sense of arrested anticipation. Ooh, change. Uh, I thought that was an interesting dynamic and Contact is a film um, uh, based on, on, on that dynamic and that sense of arrested anticipation. So we're going to MitchellRose.com now to watch Contact.
the and a filmmaker is both an artist and a technician. So it, the kind of in the first half, we've been talking about the artist part. Now we're going to get into the a little bit more into the technician side, although not totally. No, we're not. Not at all. This is still the artist side. <laughs> um, but one thing that we heard a lot in the in the PowerPoint part was about editing uh, is the choreography. And uh, although there's there's not a whole lot I can do, I can talk a little bit about editing here, but we can't do any hands-on stuff, but I can talk about it uh, generally and conceptually. Um, first of all, let's just get the software thing out of the way. The software does not does not matter. I can teach you to drive, and if you, uh, once you have learned how to drive, like how to do a left turn and go into the correct lane and things like that, and and how to pace yourself coming up the on, on from the on the entrance ramp and things like that, that's how to drive. So once you can do that, who cares if you're in a Ford or a Toyota, right? It's the same thing. Some of the things are in different places, but it's the art of editing that's the important thing. Nevertheless, people ask about software and you have to have some software. Okay, so here's a completely uncomprehensive list <coughs> of, um, some of some of your software options. <coughs> so if you have a Mac, you, it comes with iMovie, that's free and it'll be pretty good. I, I personally work in Final Cut Pro. Um, it's, it costs 300 bucks for life. If you're in the academic world, it, it's 200. Uh, DaVinci Resolve is completely free. Um, there's also a more expensive, more, f f f more full version that costs 300 bucks, but you can be doing a lot for 300 bucks, and it's a very full featured uh, program. And there's Adobe Premiere, which is 30 bucks a month for the rest of your life, or if you're an academic, 20 bucks a month. If you have an iPad, <clears throat> you can iMovie is also on that, and that's free. Or you can get Adobe Premiere Rush, which is free. And there's like tons more options. I'm just giving you a couple here. If you have a PC, again, DaVinci Resolve exists on that platform also, and it's free. Or you can again, you can get Premiere and pay those, pay that money. I personally hate subscription models, <clears throat> which is why I teach my students Final Cut Pro. Pay one thing and be done for the rest of your life without having to just like pay forever. Um, <clears throat> because <clears throat> my uh, classes, well, they had to move online and who knows how long they'll continue to stay online. I'm learning DaVinci Resolve right now because it, it exists on both platforms and students can get it for free. So I think that's a pretty good option. It's a very full program. Um, uh, and when I was like watching a tutorial for it the other day to start learning it, like 15 minutes into it, I was just watching going, yeah, I can do that. I, can, I didn't even have to try it. Like what I know with Final Cut, I could just immediately begin doing that. It's just like, this, you know, the stick shift is in different places, you know? <clears throat> anyway. Um, all right. But like I say, the editing is the art of dance film. Um, if I said, empty your purses, empty your backpack, empty your pocket onto the desk, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's your house keys, there's your key fob, there's a, a miniature bottle of Purell, all different like things there. Um, then I could say, now arrange those and make them into an artistic sculpture, right? And you would slide this over here, you'd put this over here, and hmm, I'll have these things been, you, you would be able to find the art of that. And that's kind of like what editing is, is here's stuff. I have this footage and I'm going to somehow arrange this stuff you know, into art. Um, for that reason, I often feel, well, there's three stages of film creation. There's the writing stage, which is coming up with the idea and like, what am I gonna do and you know, is there going to be choreography and what's that choreography going to be? Then there's the production stage where you actually shoot the thing. And then there's the post-production or editing stage, um, which is also your final rewrite. This is when you get to actually rewrite what you have because it doesn't matter what your idea was when you're editing. It's what you have now. I have this stuff. What can I do with this? So again, beginner's mind. I had like a film that I shot and <clears throat> production, it was 80 people and shot from a helicopter and there was like technical problems. It just, 
completely didn't work. And I put it aside for two years because I knew that if I tried to edit it right away, I would keep trying to make that film. And I didn't have the footage to make that film. Two years later, I looked back at it and said like, okay, I have this. What can, what can I do with this? And I came up with a completely different idea. Um, so I think it, it's important to take beginner's mind into the editing process and go like, once you've shot your stuff, forget what your original intent was. What can you do with that stuff that you have now? Do you, um, do you, do you mind yes. sharing just briefly what you did do with that footage while we're on the topic? Sure. Uh, you can see it, not now, on my website. It's called Targeted Advertising. Originally, it was supposed to be a um, five-minute steady cam, like a big group piece of choreography. Uh, people like running over on, on this like a uh, racetrack. People like huge groups running this way and it's all kind of organized like Rudolf von Laban kind of mass movement. Um, and uh, shot by a flying steady cam. This, this like helicopter was going to like go all around. It was all totally choreographed. But they couldn't do the helicopter because there was a cell phone tower there interfering with it. So these 80 people had shown up, so we just shot it anyway. So two years later, I looked at it and, and came up with a total, totally different idea of like using just little clips of it going, well, what would happen if in the future spam bots <laughs> didn't just send you spam to you in your email, but they like flew around in the air shouting advertising at you. <laughs> Great deals are at Olive Garden. Take your family today for, you know, like that kind of like in minority report when he's walking around and he's getting like personalized advertising that way. So anyway, you can, so you can take a look at targeted advertising later. It's not a great film, but it's, it's amusing, and I kind of just put it together because I felt like I owed it to the 80 dancers who showed up that day. There's also a making of video right, uh, uh, link right beneath it, <clears throat> so you can take a look at that uh, of the, of the ill-fated day. Okay, um, so to practice dance film, uh, film thinking, in making something, I would suggest that you just shoot some random movement stuff don't like go start with a piece of choreography maybe have a dancer just do a little of this and a little of that and maybe just get a bicycle tire going around and around maybe get like a light bulb turning on and off or a drip out of your faucet and then a dancer doing this or people just like walking back and forth or coming up an escalator i would just shoot some random movement and then try to cut it into a dance film and see what you can do. I think you'll. I think that will kind of force you to approach this thing filmically. Uh, and, and I think it's a really fun editing exercise, also. Um, okay, uh, I want to talk about musicality, also. Um, and by musicality, I, I don't just mean like music, but I mean the cadence and the internal rhythm. Uh, of any time-based art form, which I think is the thing that really gives, gives it life and gives it specialness. Musicality, uh, I think for dancers, they often think of it as phrasing, that it's a swirl of interplay, this, a swirling interplay of legato and staccato, of just the luxury of a holding back on the beat, and then the, the surprise and, and, and sense of joyous anticipation as we just jump ahead of the beat a little bit. This is the way to do your editing also. Rather than, I'm going to show this clip, and now here's this clip, and then here's this action of like giving everything its due time of like, there's this, and then there's this. There should be joyous surprises in the editing. And think, I often think of it like in Dear John, when I edited it, I thought of the editing as being the third musician, that music is piano and cello. And I thought of the editing as being the third thing that's accompanying them. Ba, 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 di, 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 da, da. So I think every time there's an edit, I think our brains register an EEG spike of anticipation. The, the pupils go, whoo, you know, every time there's, there's an edit and there's a little change and our mind goes, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? You know, we get goosed a little bit. 
Um, so I think in our editing, rather than just here's some stuff, here's some stuff, you're not an assembler. You're a uh, artist who's making time sing. So um, just, just th think of the rhythm, think of the pacing that your, that your uh, clips are having. Watch, watch some action scenes. Action scenes are always very musical. Like watch the parkour scene in Casino Royale in the beginning or something like that. Uh, the way they cut action, they're like, mm, 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 tzz, pow. You know, it, it's, it's very musical. Musicality. Um, okay. <clears throat> I want to talk about the word that keeps coming up here, coverage. When we, wa we watch life based on what interests us, we go, I walk into a room and I go, oh, there's five people. Oh, and this person has this. And I, you know, our eye fixates around based on what interests us. The editor becomes a surrogate for the, vec for the spectator by making those choices for us. So when, when the camera comes into a room, if, if first it's establishing shot, hey, there's four people in the room. Oh, but this person has a gun. You know what I mean? Show the gun, right? So, you know, it's where our eyes are, are it's what interests us. The editor is becoming a surrogate for that. So the editor whispers to the viewer, um, hey, I think you'll find this interesting. Ooh, you didn't think this was going to happen. Oh, this, what is this person over here getting ready to do? Oh, you didn't see that coming, did you? You know, so this is the way we perceive life. And by um, shooting and editing this way, we are, we are creating a facsimile of the way we watch life. And it makes it seem real. <clears throat> so the... A way to do this is to shoot what's called coverage, which means here's a bunch of action, and I'm going to put the camera here, and I'm going to put the camera here, and I'm going to, I'm going to have, follow this person over here, I'm going to have a, a duet over here. You shoot all those different things. It gives the editor options, right? So rather than just have a, what's called a master shot of like, here's the whole thing, and we just like watch it play, you come and shoot all the different things. Yes, there is the master shot of everything, but there's also the two shot of these two people here. There's the close up of this person like tapping their finger because they're bored. Uh, you're shooting all the different elements happening in the room. You're giving your editor options. You're, be, you're giving him or her an opportunity to um, shape the thing into something new. They're, you're get, letting them rewrite, you're letting them change the pace. The thing was a little, as a, as a master shot as a scene, it's a little too draggy. It was fine maybe in the theater, it's fine in the studio, but sitting here on a screen, we're, we're not get, we don't get the life thing coming out of a screen. We ha it has to, be, has to pop a little bit more than life. So I'm gonna pick up the pace by getting rid of this and, and featuring this right away. So you wanna give yourself, um, give you give the editor options so we shoot coverage of like it, it's your plan of how am i going to shoot a scene let me just as an example let me just show you this is the typical way that a, a dialogue scene in 98 percent of movies and movies uh, movies and tv shows happen when there's two people talking to each other a shot camera a is the master shot uh, in this case, it's also called a two shot because it's getting two people. It shoots all of the action that they do. Cameras B are the singles on the uh, on the performer, um, and it, 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 an angle is going to be a little bit more attractive than a straight on or a profile shot, which will seem too stylized. You could do it, but imagine if it was profile talking to profile. It would be like Ingmar Bergman's persona or something like that. It would have a very kind of existential uh, stylization to it. Cameras to C are over the shoulder shot. They're, they're actually looking at the far person, but they're referencing the out of focus head and shoulder of the, of the listener uh, in the foreground so that we establish the relationship between the two people. So when you look at any kind of dialogue scene in a movie or anything with, with, between two people, um, it's going to look like this. Like, so watch the show that you watched tonight, look at it, and you will see this recreated. There are lots of other places to put cameras. Um, 
you know, tons. But these five shots, pretty much almost every single dialogue scene in a TV show or a movie is, will, will have this. Um, so again, I'm just, I'm, uh, this is the cl classical coverage. Uh, just to show you, like, figure out what is your, what is the action in your dance scene? The person moves over here, it, first, it, maybe it's a duet. Uh, so if the person is, like dances around here, maybe you put a camera here. So when the person moves around, all of a sudden they're in an over the shoulder. I mean, how exciting would that be to see the far person, but then all of a sudden, so in our wide shot, we saw here's two dancers and one dancer is beginning to swing around. Now I have a camera here and I just see just the far person and I think, hey, what, what I missed, I had missed to the person who's circling. What happened to them? Oh, here they are. All of a sudden they come into this over the shoulder shot. Be very satisfying. And it makes it feel real. We have a, a flat two dimensional electronic medium here and it squeezes the life out of dance. And that's the, life is the cool thing about dance. We need to recreate a sense of life. <clears throat> and so by having this, this excitement and surprises in, in the way we, we view something, but still in a paradigm of the way we view, the way we, our eye fixates when we watch things, it will make it seem like life and it'll make it come to life. Um, when you're watching a movie and a TV show, you don't th probably think about the editing. You get engrossed in the story. In a dance film, you'd get engrossed in the dancing or in the conveying of a dance experience. So um, the good shooting and good editing becomes transparent, it becomes invisible. You don't want to be so gratuitous in your creative choices that you take people out of it and you make people begin to think about filmmaking. You want people to just to take it in. Uh, and when you have not nice matching action like that, shot from many ways, your editor should be able to cut it together so it becomes completely uh, transparent and, and just gets out of the way. Sip of water. <clears throat> okay, um, I will stop sharing now because I feel selfish. No, um, where's Zoom? Here we are. Okay, just because uh, I want to go and start talking about photography. How are we doing time-wise? Okay, it'll be a fast thing in photography. <laughs> so, photography also is an art, and it's also about capturing getting a sense of life. Uh, it's not, we don't want to just like aim our recording boxes at the dancer and go like, record this. The, the beauty of photography, when you look at, an, at a wonderful photograph, <clears throat> it conveys a sense of the life of that moment and it makes it live forever. Oh, I can, I get, a, I, get I feel that moment. And that's what we want our photography to do. In this case, videography. <clears throat> So let me take a, let's take a look at a couple of our compositional options that we have. Camera. And you all have a camera. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, I need a volunteer uh, to be a dance. Oh, can you do it? Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Barbie. Barbie is gonna volunteer to be our dancer today. I bought my first Barbie doll yesterday for this. I'm so excited. Okay, so. Let me just turn on my iPad. Okay, so first element of composition, replacement in the frame. <clears throat> so, I'll talk loudly. Okay, there's Barbie. This is the way we tend to shoot. We put things in the center. And for sure, there is a power and, uh, to being in the center, but there's also kind of a bluntness. It's just like, duh, there it is in the center. There are many other options of having something be here, right? I mean, there's incredible power of having somebody be over, over on a side. There's, if you know of, I am going to talk about it now, but the rule of thirds. So here she is at a third of the way across. And there's, there's a, 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 a beautiful sense of aesthetic balance about that also. Um, if they were, she was facing off to the side, um, so, when she's over here, looking into the side, there's a sense of kind of spatial harmony to that. Like there's a big open space. 
and she's addressing that space that, that feels right. Uh, if she was off facing the edge, it creates a sense of um, spatial tension. Like, why is she ignoring it? Is there somebody off there that I can't, that I'm not seeing? Or is she angry at something? Or is she just a person who's somehow out of balance? Or, you know, there isn't, you know, is she psychologically out of balance, feeling separate from her environment? Okay, the next thing would be, I might as well just bring my notes over here. Uh, <clears throat> would be to also to talk about size. So generally, people will shoot their, um, most of their dance films in what's called a long shot, which is, which is here. The, uh, the dancer occupies the full size of it. There are many more options to that. So um, let me come back to this camera over here. Okay, there's some choreography here in which like the person does a movement like this where they're like circling their shoulder. Okay, now I come over to here and I do the same thing. There's so much more movement when I'm close, right? Like what is the point of having the lower half of my body which isn't doing anything in the shot when all the action is over here? Move in and just have that kinetic swirl of action happen. Let's say um, in, in a piece of choreography, you'll have something like this. Uh, the, um, a flexed foot, and then there'll be some like other action happening here. Most choreographers, when they make a film, will want to stay back, and they'll say, but you can't miss the flexed foot. Why? I don't care about the flexed foot. The flexed foot doesn't matter. You know, the action is happening here. I want to be able to like look into their eyes and see what's happening inside them. Like, let go of showing the whole body, right? Give people a kinetic experience. Give people a human personal experience. You don't have to try to do that by showing the whole body, which will be less human, will be uh, less personal, right? So detach. I mean, look at her. What a wonderful person. Isn't it great just to be able to come in and see the beauty that is Barbie as opposed to being here? I'm sure she looks nice enough. Okay, now the next thing also would be to talk about uh, uh, angles. <clears throat> frontal, is, frontal, again, has a bluntness to it. Um, and this is the way most people will shoot because they'll have that theater thinking of like, you know, this is the way a stage is. You know, the screen becomes a stage. Um, but shooting in a profile really connects, connects the person into space for me. And all of these things are going to have different emotional feelings as we go around. Okay? Also, height. So like, here she is, and people tend to shoot at eye height because that's the way they are. You know, their, their camera is here. And it's the easy way to shoot is just to like shoot at eye height. Let me come over to here. And I'm at eye height. I'm going to drop the camera two inches and see what happens. I lower the camera two inches and all of a sudden she has more of an aspirational feeling. She is like looking up to a, to a glorious future, right? And even the lower we get, when we get down to like eye level, it's like, she really has great plans for the, for the future, right? Also, when you shoot a dancer from a low angle like this, um, when they jump, they look like they're jumping five feet in the air. Conversely, if, when you shoot high, it begins to have that kind of like objective point of view of like it's God's POV, looking down on the puny mortals and their foolish endeavors, right? It's the security camera kind of point of view. Another fantastic uh, tool to keep in mind compositionally is uh, depth. So again, trying to fight, I'm making you nauseous here, sorry. Uh, trying to fight the, I'll just put it down. Trying to shoot, a fight, the flatness of the screen. Um, 
we want to kind of create a sense of depth. I mean, you know, this Z axis here is a fantastic thing. Like, look how fantastic that is because it, it feels like life. And I mean, it feels like I'm in a 360 degree world, you know, when you, when you do this, as opposed to, uh, you know, it's Zoom time. And so I'm going to perform and I'm going to go to the middle of my living room and just like dance around a little bit, right? So, I mean, there's no sense of depth. You're just basically saying, we're on a proscenium stage now, which is five feet wide, right? But if you can put something in the foreground, like, let me take this spray bottle here. Here's Barbie. And I just put something in the foreground here. And now there's like a sense of depth, right? Um, even like, let's say that my camera is tracking this way. So she's dancing, she's dancing. We go by a bush and over here, and we really have a sense of her in the world, that there's a three-dimensional sense about the whole thing. You know what I mean? As opposed to just like flat world, and there she is, like up on the stage, 100 feet away. Anything you can do to create a sense of depth will really enrich your film. I always encourage my students to use manual controls as much as possible. And you actually can do that on an iPhone. <clears throat> there are third party apps you can get for an iPhone like, and, and, and uh, Androids um, where you can have manual controls, but even the iPhone has some. So let's say that I wanted to um, expose on the gravel out in the driveway. So if I just touch it and hold it, 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 it if I just touch it, it, focuses and exposes on the driveway. But if you actually touch and hold like that, you can see how at the top it says AEA, auto expose, auto focus lock, right? Now, when I drag my finger up and down, you raise the exposure and you lower the exposure. Okay, well, I wanna stop and allow a little bit of time for um, questions and answers. So, um, if you have a question, I will try to provide an answer. You can do the raise hand or you can just like wave violently to me and I'll try to recognize you. Yes, Cara, here comes that question about uh, Dear John or Advance. Yeah. Advance, yeah. I was curious how long that took you. Advance? No, Dear John. Oh, Dear John, uh, we shot in six hours. Oh. <clears throat> and except for the part of, of him on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to rent that thing, which is surprisingly inexpensive. Um, <laughs> it was like seven fifty or six fifty for the day. It's amazing. And they don't ask to see any OSHA license or anything like that. You just say, you know, I call up and go like, we want to rent an excavator. Uh, what size? Uh, yeah, big one. Pretty big one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are, I guess there are five different sizes and this is the fourth largest ones or something. And they just got there in the field and it was just there. And we got in the sky to be an operator for it. So it's storyboarded out. So we're able to kind of go through it pretty quickly. There were some that are tough, like the one where Jamie holds onto the thing and it begins going around and it takes him on the leaping journey. So, um, uh, we did 18 takes of that. And what you're seeing is the first take. <laughs> because because the guy, the operator, got too scared that he was going to rip Jamie's arm out. And so he begins feathering it a little, you know, going a little faster. And so it's just like boring with him hanging there. The first one, you know, has a nice uh, attack to it. So so that was the one. Well, I had one other question, but I, I think it was answered. Um, which, you know, for the... I guess it was advance. That was the second one. The one with the, it's a walking dance where they walk away from camera. <clears throat> yeah, I noticed that the frame was coming in and out yeah. and it was right. moving. And I, I gathered you did that to give that sense of um, dance happening within. The no, but I was glad, but I was happy to have that happen. So um, most software, not, uh, not iMovie, but Final Cut, Da Vinci, Premiere, all those things have what's called stabilization. So like it'll, it'll take like a kind of rough handheld shot where it's moving a little bit and make it a little bit more like a steady cam, smooth it out. So what it does is it looks 
at the it, it tried to figure out what the, what is the what are the figures um in the frame and it moves the frame to keep the, the figures in the same place hmm. right so if the camera is doing this it will keep them here and move the world this way to to, st to stabilize them out <clears throat> so that means that the edge of the frame has to do this the edge of the frame that you're seeing is the opposite of the camera movement, right? If the camera bumped this way, it'll have to move this way to, to smooth that out. So normally what happens in stabilization is the image gets scaled up to get, to get that black out of the way, right? So, you, so it gets slightly out of focus, but, you know, but it moves up slightly. And then as it moves around, you don't see the black. But I like the black. You know, I thought it gave it gave it a kind of a cruel, cruel. <laughs> gave it a it gave it a cool grunge type quality. Uh, you know, rough edged, and I and I liked that. Uh, so uh -huh. left it. So hi, this is Mark. Um, just wanted to uh, comment about the contact, the last film. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that was a handheld operation and it wasn't one of those kind of deals where you can program the the gimbal to go exactly I wish. And, you know so so I'll, you know i'm assuming you had to shoot just jamie uh alone first and then shoot him with with the people coming into the frame precisely all of that so so on those because it was handheld um, you were just kind of guesstimating approximately where the shot was or or was it more sophisticated than than that to to duplicate the same angle yeah um, well um, if you look at contact on the website right beneath that is a making of that one also that will show you a little bit about how that how that was done <clears throat> but basically that we would shoot two versions of each one uh, Jamie uh, with the person like so let's say there's the shot where uh the woman jumps down and he catches her right so there'd be the one where he actually where he does where she does he does catch her well he would do his whole dance in the, the that the eight second phrase whatever it is and then like catch her okay so then he would do this the, the same thing again and this time he doesn't catch her but he takes it off into the new thing whatever that is Okay, so when he started that phrase, well, okay, when he ends the phrase, helpers run in and put little tapes on the ground where his feet are. Uh, likewise, if I was like, if I was shooting, so like if I'm moving here to here, I also, they put tapes where mine, where my feet were. Okay, so now we're going back to do the other version without the woman. So I go back to the tapes from the previous shot that we did, which are still there. So that's my start. I go through my movement and I'm looking for the tapes and I, and I, and I hit those again and, and he hits his again. So then I, and I had um, a laptop there on the set. And so doing each one, I would go, go, we would stop. I'd go back and try to edit it in, make sure it worked, find out eh, we need, you need to do this or something like that. And then we would just keep doing it until we got a close enough match. And um, I saw another hand go up. Della, was it you? Somebody. You have laryngitis. It was Sammy. Yeah. What you got? So pardon me, because I, I haven't seen your whole like portfolio, but have you worked with animation or like stop motion? Or I, I don't know. I was thinking of the little video of the birds and like how much farther you've gone towards like not people involved. Yeah, well, um, yeah, <clears throat> let's see, what have I got? Um, I have a dance, it'll take too long to get it, but uh, if you go back to my website, there's a dance called Case Studies from the Grouch Center for Sleep Disorders, and there's stop motion on that with two people on a bed, uh, and it's, it's all choreographed, but it's all just done in stop motion, but it's like a whole bed dance, which has now been copied by many people, it was copied then by a music video called Her Morning Elegance. And then uh, Target um, had an advertisement where they copied that. So, yeah. But uh, it's actually pretty lovely just to see still images of these two people in bed doing a dance. But it's all done by stop motion. I have uh, a, 
another film called Elevator World, which is about the special dynamics of what happens when people get into an elevator and how the whole world shifts a little bit. Um, that's called Elevator World. That's also on the website. Um, so yeah, a lot. And, but my, I have a well-known film called Learn to Speak Body, which has like three or four million views. Uh, and that also has, is about body language. And that also has some um, animated elements in it, like arrows flying around and things like that. So, oh, and <clears throat> there's an, I, I have another unsuccessful film that uh, called Cubed that I did a few years ago, which was done with motion capture. And so, in a 3D virtual world, there are four cubes. And on each side of the cube, you see a dancer that was shot green screen. On the front side, you see their front. And on the side, you see the side. and the back, you see the back. So as the cubes turn, you see now profile, now back, now profile like that. And so the four cubes move in this 3D world. And you see the choreography that way. Um, I don't think it's terribly successful, but it was just an idea that I wanted to try. So you can also, you can watch that because that's, um, it, it, that has both green screen and 3D animation and motion capture in it. Um, and, and there's a making of video beneath that, <laughs> making of, which is more interesting than the film itself. Thanks. R Rivka's raising her hand. Hey. I was being the good kid and, and following instructions. Very good. <laughs> um, so I guess I have a gazillion questions and I feel like we could do one of these every week for six months and not run out of things to talk about. That's um, my job. Yeah. But, but they pay tuition. <laughs> that's a cool job, yeah. Um, I, I guess it was more of a, a broader question um, because there's so many things about process to talk about but it was, a, it was a broad question about recurring themes in your work that you have noticed or, um, cause I feel like, you know, the John Deere one, maybe you, it, could, it could be said it's about yearning or escape and, and um, the travel one, uh, I forget what it was called. Advanced. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe also some of those ideas or just mo forward momentum um, and, yeah, so if you just had some, some, you know, sort of a summary of what you've learned about yourself through what you're expressing in these dance films. Oh, it's not pretty what I've learned about myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I will say also that the three films that I showed, um, I don't think are really representative of my body of work because I just wanted to show you things that are more just about film thinking in, in dance filmmaking, but there's usually a lot more humor in my stuff and they tend to be a little bit more human than those. I mean, I know that they're human, but um, I would say recurring theme that I've always had is, is alienation um, from, of the individual in modern society and not, not feeling necessarily connected uh, to the world around them and um, the foibles of contemporary human endeavor. I'm a hippie, <laughs> I'm a former hippie and I just want us all to get along and live together in a world of peace and love. Uh, and our, our present society doesn't allow, doesn't make that very easy and so it most of my films are about like can't we all just get along you know can't uh this strange contemporary society that we've built people just don't feel comfortable in it they're just kind of getting by or you know making do something like that Thank you. Well, we're at 1.34, do you guys, does anybody have any uh, brief last questions? I can talk about myself forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Thank you so much, everybody, for showing up and, and participating. Um, and yeah, if, 
if we, we'll post the link to the recorded video um, on the Facebook page and everywhere on social media and on my website. Um, so, and uh, you want to say any final words, Mitchell? Well, just to um, uh, make sure you go take a look at all those other films on MitchellRose.com. There's also a film that I was going to try to show you, uh, but we kind of ran out of time called The Case Against Dance Film, which is a thing that I made here in COVID lockdown. I just shot it uh, in an isolation booth, but it's an argument uh, that dance film is bad. I don't, I don't actually believe it, but it's good to be able to argue both sides. So uh, in, the, in, in the interest of being fair and balanced, uh, I, um, I have that too. So it's, you may find that amusing. So there's that and yeah, um, you, you can um, contact me via, the, uh, via my website if anybody has any questions or anything. But I appreciate your attention today. It's been fun talking with you. And uh, stay safe and wear a mask. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.